And if you would, turn your Bibles to Acts chapter 20. These scripture will be on the screen. But tonight, we're continuing our study on the book of Acts. This is a very exciting study to study these men who were leaders in the first church. Peter, James, John, Paul, and others being mightily used by the Holy Ghost. Not by power, nor by might. God said it's by my spirit. And Jesus taught them that. Hallelujah. But not only were these apostles being greatly used of God, but the entire body of Christ, just ordinary church members, they were being mightily used of God. My subject tonight, Paul in the hands of Imperial Rome. Let us pray. Father, we love you. Thank you, Lord, for the Holy Ghost, the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead. You said that. He would manifest himself to us and through us to a lost and suffering world. And, Lord, this early church, they were on fire for God. Set us ablaze with your glory. And, Lord, you said we're to do your works, the same works and greater works. And that's what we're expecting, Lord, in these latter days. And the church said in Jesus' name, amen. In Acts chapter 20, the Holy Ghost begins to warn Paul in every city as he journeys to Jerusalem, that he's going to face imprisonment and afflictions. Now, God warns Paul through the supernatural gifts of the Spirit. We read the Bible, and we just think, you know, this is something that's put in there. No, God is telling the early church through the gifts of the Spirit what is going on. So he gave him a prophetic word, and a prophetic word, a word of wisdom, it speaks about the future. A word of knowledge tells you something that you can only know supernaturally that exists. You cannot know it any other way. You, it's not a gift of the word of knowledge, if that's the case. The Holy Spirit, he shows you. And the word of wisdom is the same. The, the Holy Spirit gives you a word about your future. And I'm pointing these out because I want to empower this church. I've studied these. I don't know anywhere you can go and get this information other than right here. You know anywhere, Pastor Ricky, you can go get this? Okay, hallelujah. This is the place. Amen. So the church is growing, but it is not growing because of church growth techniques. I wish I could get some people in leadership to realize that. The church is growing, but it is not growing because of church growth techniques. It is growing because the gifts of the Spirit are operating through the leadership and the laity, and they are all being led by the Holy Spirit. That's what will make a real church. You might grow an organization, but you will never grow the church, the true church of the Lord Jesus Christ, without the power and the anointing of the Holy Ghost. Point number one, a word of wisdom, Acts 20, 22. Paul, he is speaking to the church at Ephesus right here. Trying to break out a lot of scripture and help, help us get some understanding. And now, behold, Paul said, I go bound in the spirit to Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall befall me there, except that the Holy Ghost witnesses in every city saying that bonds and afflictions are waiting for me. Paul had been to Jerusalem many times, but the Holy Ghost warns him through the word of wisdom that bonds and afflictions are waiting for him when he gets to Jerusalem. Now, look at Paul's determination, Acts 20, verse 24. Paul said, but none of these things move me. Neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I may finish my course with joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord to testify the gospel of the grace of God. That's a man with a determined spirit, a made-up mind. He said, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. If you ever get to that place in your life, you won't feel anything, I promise you. Secondly, point number two, another word of wisdom here. Again, the Holy Ghost warns Paul of the destiny that awaits him in Jerusalem. I want you to see how many times the Spirit keeps telling him this. Acts 21 and 4, and finding disciples, we tarried there seven days, who said to Paul, through the Spirit, gift of the Spirit, that he should not go up to Jerusalem. 
What I want you to notice is this. The gifts of the Spirit were functioning in the church. This is not an apostle, a prophet, an evangelist, a pastor, a teacher telling him this. This is the church, the laity, okay? It wasn't just one or two that had these gifts, but wherever Paul went, Paul found disciples, and through the Spirit, he was supernaturally told about his future. Now, we try all types of things trying to, to do what they did. But I believe if we'll get full of the Holy Ghost and open our eyes and our hearts to understanding the gifts of the Spirit, we will see how they function and how we can function. I, there's certain things I've seen in the Bible that Paul did. I said, if Paul can do that, I can do that. I got the same Holy Ghost. If Peter can do that, I can do that. I got the same Holy Ghost. God has no respect of person. I just need to seek him with all my heart till I find him, and that's true of the church. Now, this time, the word of wisdom is functioning through disciples who were simply church members. They weren't apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers, a part of the five-fold ministry. They were disciples, regular church members. That excites me. That means that my job as a pastor is to equip you to do the works of the ministry, to teach you about the gifts of the Spirit. This proves that the gifts of the Spirit do not just flow through the hierarchy, but the gifts flow through the total body of Christ. And knowledge is power, and that's why I'm teaching these things. That means that the total body of Christ must learn to be subject to God's ordained authority too. The entire body has to be subject to God's leadership. And the gifts are to function like that. But let me tell you something. If you don't have someone leading, you will have something wild on your hands. I promise you that. You can't let everybody do what is right in their own eyes. Because if they do, you're going to have problems in your church. There has to be some order and some structure to the gifts of the Spirit. Paul covers that quite a bit in Acts chapter 12 through 14. The gifts are to flow through the total body, but we have to have order about it. Some people, they speak in tongues and just keep on speaking in tongues. And I had somebody ask me a long time ago, said, has that person got the real Holy Ghost? I said, yeah, they have the real Holy Ghost, but they're out of order. And thank God I didn't have to bring correction to that elderly person. They kind of got the message. <laughs> Hallelujah. That's why I'm teaching the book of Acts, and identifying these gifts because they're to function and they're to operate through the entire body of Christ. But there has to be an order and a structure. He said, let everything be done decently and in order. And so it, it takes leadership and somebody that's strong in leadership to get things in order and unified and flowing together. It takes the Holy Ghost leading that person. Point number three, the gift of prophecy. Now, we find the gift of prophecy, not the word of wisdom and the word of knowledge. They're revelational gifts. The gift of prophecy is an inspirational gift. Tongues, interpretation, and prophecy, those are speaking gifts, inspirational gifts. Now, remember, Paul is on his way to Jerusalem, and he's been warned that he's going to face some danger ahead. Look at Acts 21 and 8. The next day, we that were of Paul's company departed and came to Caesarea, and we entered into the house of Philip the evangelist. Remember him back in Acts chapter 8? <laughs> he went from serving tables to being an evangelist and turned the whole city upside down, got the Ethiopian eunuch saved, and he goes to Africa and carries the gospel. Philip the evangelist, which was one of the seven, seven disciples, and abode with them. Paul stayed with them. And the same man had four daughters, virgins, which did prophesy. Now, that doesn't mean they are operating in revelational gifts, and I'm going to show you something right here. The gift of prophecy is a manifestation gift that's given to bless the entire congregation. It is not given to, to tell you the future. It's not given to speak a word over you. It only does three things. It edifies, it exhorts, and it comforts. It does not tell the future. That's the office of the prophet or someone that's operating in the gift of the word of wisdom. So this is the only manifestation gift. This is the thing that shocked me about it. 
that its function is identified and a definition is given and people want to make this gift something that it is not. So, and if you don't understand this, you'll, you'll read other people's books and you won't understand. It is a manifestation gift. It is not a planned sermon. It's not a prepared sermon. And you, you can prophesy while you're doing it. It exhorts, it edifies, and it comforts. But this gift is a supernatural manifestation of the Holy Ghost. You cannot manifest it at will. It's when the Spirit moves upon you. Look at 1 Corinthians 14 and 3. But he that prophesied, not talking about a prophet, speaketh unto men to edification, exhortation, and comfort. Woody Bradley operates strongly in this gift. Sister Charlotte operates strongly in this gift. You will see this gift. People that you get around them, they just edify you, exhort you, and comfort you. It's a gift of the Holy Ghost. And you can't manifest it yourself. It's something the Spirit gives to you. These four daughters of Philip the Evangelist, they were operating this gift, and I just gave you the definition, the Bible definition. Paul said concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I would not have you to be ignorant. And then I, I said, we're so ignorant. And, and so I'm giving you Dr. Lester Sumrall's definitions, and that's where I pull all of my information from because I've got everybody else's teaching that I could get my hand upon. And I've taken these back to the Bible, and all of these gifts have operated in my life at one time or another using these definitions. Using other people's definitions, I get off course. So the Bible says what prophecy is. And so don't ever get that mixed up. This is the simple gift of prophecy. And Paul said, all may prophesy, and that one by one. So everybody in the church is to prophesy, but not everybody operates in these other supernatural gifts. He says, let all, everyone prophesy and that one by one. So you see, there is an order. And prophecy is exactly what the Bible says it is. Don't try to make it something that it isn't. Now, let's identify the word of wisdom, which is a prophetic gift that reveals the future. I want you to, we're going to move now from simple prophecy over into the, man, the uh, revelational gifts, and we're going to look at the word of wisdom. Once more, the Spirit advised Paul that when he reached Jerusalem, he was going to be imprisoned. Look at Acts 21 and 10. And as we tarried there many days, there came down from Judea a certain prophet. There he is. He's the prophet named Agabus. And when he was coming to us, he took Paul's girdle and bound his own hands and feet and said, Thus saith the Holy Ghost. So shall the Jews at Jerusalem bind the man that owneth this girdle, shall deliver him in the hands of the Gentiles. That's amazing to me. Everybody wants to prophesy your future and stuff, and this man's not giving Paul good news. But Paul had already been told twice now. This is about the third time that there's danger and afflictions and hardships waiting for him if he goes to Jerusalem. And Agabus the prophet comes down and picks this girdle up and tells Paul about his future. So look at Acts 21 and 12. When we heard these things, both we and they of that place besought him not to go up to Jerusalem. Paul knew through the gift of the word of wisdom that he was going to be arrested. He was going to be turned over to the Roman government, and that was going to happen because the Holy Ghost had said that if he went to Jerusalem. Look, look, let's read verse 12 again. When we heard these things, both we and they of that place asked Paul, don't go up to Jerusalem. Then Paul answered, what mean you to weep and to break my heart? For I am ready not to be bound only, but also to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Hmm. What a consecrated life. I'm willing to go there, not only to be bound, but I'm willing to die if that's what God wants. <laughs> that wasn't God's plan. And, and you don't know if you really have this type of consecration until you have to use it. You don't know what you will do in a situation like this. Let me tell you, when, when I got into combat, I had been trained. But when those mortars started bursting around me, 
my adrenaline kicked in and everything really started taking off. And you don't know how you're going to react, but you'll know real quick if you get in a dangerous place, whether you got the goods or not. But something inside of Paul said, none of these things move me. And so he lived his life recklessly, if you want to say that, for the Lord and not for himself. He was a man that was God's man. And if he was impressed by the Spirit to do it, Paul, this man of God, this man that was caught up in the third heaven, he was so consecrated to God that he just did it. Now, remember the great apostle, he is nearing the end of his public ministry. And the Holy Ghost is directing his life, just like he always said. We've come to the year A.D. 60, 27 years after the day of Pentecost. The church has been grinding through empires. The church has been growing for 27 years. And by this time, it has now touched Caesar's household. And it was the, the leadership, the apostles, the fivefold ministry, and the church working together that made this church so great and the gifts of the Holy Ghost. Not church growth seminars. I can't say that enough. Paul had been warned by the Holy Ghost that he would be arrested in Jerusalem and turned over to the Roman government. That's your destiny, Paul. That's what the Holy Ghost let him know. He said, I'm going. Now, in Acts chapter 22, he is arrested. And Paul, he falls into the hands of imperial Rome, and he never gets free again. Think about that. You read the book of Acts, from this point on, after he gets to Jerusalem, he gets turned over into the hands of imperial Rome, and he never gets free again. He was bound with chains, but he was not bound in the spirit. Hallelujah. I said, you can be bound with chains, but you don't have to be bound in the spirit, and this man wasn't. In Acts chapter 22 at Jerusalem, Paul gives his testimony of his first encounter with Jesus Christ. Think about that. He's going to give his testimony. And in, in, in this study, from Acts 20 to Acts 26, I found three times that he gives his testimony. So point number five is Paul gives his testimony. Now, when Paul reached Jerusalem, he wants to tell the people about his encounter with Jesus and what God had done through him and how the Lord Jesus had paid sin's debt. Look at Acts 22 and 6. It came to pass that as I made my journey was come near unto Damascus about noon. He's telling about what happened to him on the Damascus road. Suddenly there shone up from heaven a great light round about me. And I fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to me, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And I answered, Who art thou, Lord? And he said unto me, I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom thou persecutest. He was killing Christians at this time. God arrested him. <laughs> Verse 9 says, And they that were with me saw indeed the light and were afraid, but they heard not the voice of him that spake to me. He was speaking to Paul in a language that Paul understood. They could hear what was being said, but they did, didn't understand it, meaning they didn't understand the language. Paul, he, he knew multiple languages. And I said, What shall I do, Lord? Verse 10. And the Lord said unto me, Arise and go into Damascus. It shall be told thee all the things which are appointed for thee to do. You know, God did not give him all the details. So this is the word of wisdom operating again. God is telling him, you're going to do some things for me. And he, look at Acts 22 and 19. Paul is still giving his testimony about how he met Jesus that day on the Damascus Road, Acts twenty two nineteen, And I said, Lord, I like that. He didn't just get a Savior that day. That man said, who art thou, Lord? He got up off the, the dirt, brushing himself off. He's blind. He can't see a thing. And he says, who art thou, Lord? Huh. I said, Lord, they know that I imprison and beat in every synagogue them that believed on you. Verse 20. 
It says, and when the blood of the martyr Stephen was shed, I was also standing by and consenting unto his death and kept his raiment while they slew him. Hmm. And he said unto me, depart, for I will send thee far hence unto the Gentiles. He doesn't know all the hardships he's going to face. He just knows he is a chosen vessel that God is going to use mightily. Paul told those men at Jerusalem about his conversion. He's testifying. He had given them his testimony, and he told them of the ministry that God had called him to. But I want you to look at their reaction because just because God calls you and God empowers you and God sends you, that does not mean everybody is going to accept you and like you. Okay? Look at their reaction. Acts 22, 22. And they gave him audience unto this word and then lifted up their voices and said, Away with such a fellow from the earth, for it is not fit that he should live. Oh, my Lord. And they, as they cried out and cast off, they tore the clothes off, cast off their clothes and threw dust into the air. And then the, look at verse 24. The chief captain commanded him to be brought into his castle. Hmm. And bade that he should be examined by scourging, that they might know wherefore he cried, they cried out against him. Now, Paul had been warned several times through the word of wisdom what would happen to him when he reached Jerusalem. He had been warned through prophecies in many different cities. But many different people had told him this. They had told Paul what would happen when he got to Jerusalem. So this was not a great surprise to the apostle Paul. Paul had said earlier, I'm ready not only to be bound, but also to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Something inside of Paul said, none of these things move me. If you ever get a warrior spirit like that inside of you, nothing will ever move you. You will stand in the face of anything and say, God will take care of me. And that's where the church needs to get to. When you get to that place, none of these things move me. That means you can stand in the face of all adversity in a hat full of devils. And you can know that God's hand is on you and that God is controlling you, your movements, and your destiny. That's a good place to get to. I promise you this. Paul had something inside of him called the Holy Ghost. That <laughs> said, none of these things move. If you got the Holy Ghost tonight, then go on and praise God. And none of these things move us. Hallelujah. <laughs> so we see all these prophecies being fulfilled. And now Paul is in the hands of imperial Rome. So we read the Bible and we miss these. We don't see that these are supernatural gifts of the Spirit of God surging through God's people and directing them to grow the church and expand the kingdom of God. Hallelujah. Now, if you were to take the gifts of the Spirit out of the book of Acts, all you would have left is a skeleton. Without the gifts, you have no meat. You have no blessings. You don't have anything much to talk about in that without the gifts. And we read it, and we don't see the gifts there. And so my assignment and what I love to do is find these and then to share these gifts because you will find yourself in a place somewhere and you will wonder, why did I say that? Why did I do that? Why did I say that to that person? And you will realize it may take a little time, but that was a gift of the word of knowledge, the word of wisdom, or discerning of spirits when you recognize a person's human spirit. These are revelational gifts, by the way. I love the gifts. That's why you've got to believe in the gifts. If you take them out, all you've got is a skeleton. You've got to understand their functioning. If you don't, you'll be just like most dead churches in the community. They have no manifestations of the Holy Ghost. And people come in there and leave just the way they came in. I don't want to leave here like I came. I had a long day yesterday. I got home about 5.30 and I started with... Helping Teresa at 10 that morning, and I was trying to, to get everything done. I walked in the door at 5.15 or 5.30, and I 
and I, I said, I'm exhausted. But I wanted to go to revival. It was an hour and a half away. She said, Jerry, why don't you just go on and get dressed? I know you're going. She knows me that well. And I said, okay. So I went and got dressed, and I drove an hour and 15, an hour and 30 minutes to get to that church. And it was out in the middle of nowhere. She asked me when I got home, did you see any deer? I said, about nine. She said, why don't you drive that bullet? I said, I don't want to because I know it's going to be a lot of deer out there. But I, I went in there. I came home. I got home at, at 12, 15, and I'm pumping, pumping, pumping. I read, I, I read some more. Didn't go to sleep right away. I'm just full. The Holy Ghost, the refreshings of the Spirit. I said, I'm going to get refreshed, and God sent me on a mission that was one little boy. I didn't ask to pray for anybody. They said, we want you to pray for this little boy. And I prayed for that little boy. And I'm waiting to hear about his miracle. Because I knew that's why I was there. It was something inside of me that just drew me, that, that, that propelled me forward to go. And when I feel those urgings of the Holy Ghost, I know I'm going on a mission for God. Hallelujah. But that's how you know when, when you have that impression from the Spirit. That God wants you to go somewhere. You just do it. And Paul knew he was going to Jerusalem. He was going to get in trouble. So the chief captain came and he arrested Paul. And later he's brought before the high priest Ananias. Now I want you to look at Acts 23 verse 10. Here's the word of wisdom again. I want you to see these gifts. Acts 23 10. And when there arose a great dissension, the chief captain fearing least Paul should have been pulled in pieces, commanded the soldiers to go down and to take him by force from among them and bring them him into the castle. Look at this. Verse 11, here it is. And the following, the night following, the Lord, Jesus, Lord, the Lord stood by him and said, be of good cheer. I mean, the man's arrested and the Jesus, the Lord, stands beside him and said, be of good cheer, Paul. For as thou hast testified of me in Jerusalem, so must you bear witness also at Rome. So now this man knows, not the, the shipwreck, not the storm that's coming. He just knows one thing. I'm on my way to Rome. Hallelujah. Because the Lord had told him. Isn't that beautiful? To me, it is. This meant that nobody could kill him en route to Rome. It's impossible. That snake that bit him, it could not kill him. He's on his way to Rome. I tell people, get in touch with somebody that's on their way somewhere. Hallelujah. They can't die before they reach the, what God has called them to do. Ah, you're not half as excited as I am. Hallelujah. They couldn't kill him until they got there. That's the good part. He had traveling papers from God. Let me show you another man that had traveling papers from God. Look at what Jesus told Peter. Look at John 21, 18. Jesus said, truly, truly, I say unto you, when thou was young, thou went, girded us that place, and walked wherever you wanted to. But when you are old, thou shalt stretch forth your hand, and another shall lead thee, gird thee, and carry you whither you do not want to go. Huh. This he spake, look at this, signifying by what death he should glorify God. You want to gifts of the spirit operating in your life both these men you know that we all gonna die some people die a thousand times before they ever get there can't die but once so live your life to the fullest and enjoy the presence of god and don't let anybody stop you when god tells you to do something don't let the naysayers keep you from being everything god wants you to be don't let those that have no passion keep you and and, and they they've got their sight set in the wrong way Keep your eyes on Jesus Christ. Keep your eyes on the prize. Press in on him, and he'll talk to you. Go and praise him. He'll show you things to come. And when the sorrows of life come, he'll inject you with joy unspeakable that's full of glory. Glory to God. I love serving the Lord. Hallelujah. How would you like to have a word like that from God? If the Lord says you're going to get old, guess what? Get ready to live a long time. Now, the Lord gave me a word of wisdom. I'm going to find mine right here. In 
2009. I went back today and checked all my dates. On November the 5th, 2009, they told me, said, we got to go back in your heart again. We don't know what's going on. I, I'm riding to the prison to visit somebody. I said, Lord, I wasn't expecting that kind of report. All I expect them to do is say that everything's all right. Come back and see us in a year. Y'all heard my story. God spoke to me, said, with long life, will I satisfy you and show you my glory? He said, glory. I came home, and Teresa met me at the door with his card. I carry it with me. This is my testimony. Hallelujah. How many people do you know that have a word from God like that? And, and, and so he says, fear not, he will cover you with his feathers, and under his wings you will find refuge. No evil shall befall you, neither will any plague come near your home. But he will give his angels charge concerning you to guard you in all your ways. Today, God says to you, because you have loved me, I will deliver you. You will call upon me, and I will answer you. I will be with you in trouble. I will rescue you and honor you. I said, where is that in the Bible? She said, Psalms 91. I said, get a Bible, King James Version, and read the next verse. I guarantee you it says, with long life will I satisfy you and show you my glory. She said, well, it says salvation. I said, well, salvation is glory. It's the same thing. Hallelujah. But I found out later what that word salvation means. If you got a strong concordance, go look it up. It means Yeshua. I'll show you Jesus. And many of y'all in the old church, when I, I left my body and went up into heaven and saw the glory of God. God said glory, so I saw glory. Hallelujah. <laughs> I've never been the same. You never will. God spoke that to me on November the 5th. I went and looked it up. I write these things down. The card arrived the same day, November the 5th. I was reading a book by Jensen Franklin, waiting for them to go in my heart on November the 22nd, 2009. And, and I flipped the page of that book, and it was Psalms 91 in its entirety. I said, let me read this first. And I looked at my wife. I said, don't worry about it. Everything's going to be all right. This is the third time. I'm still not healed, okay? I, I have a book by Smith Wigglesworth, the complete collection of his works on 12, 14, 19, 22. It started, you know, in November. This is December the 14th, 1922. I was reading his book, and it had it in there. He said, if you can ever understand Psalms 91 and 16, you can get anything from God. I haven't got all of it yet. I'm still working on that. That same book on November, the, December the 17th, three days later, he had that in his book again. He said, look at me. I'm 63 years of age. He said, I don't know what it is to have a body. I said, I haven't got there yet. He said, I have no pains in my body. I said, Lord, I'm working on that. Won't you work on me? Wouldn't you like to live in this world understanding the complete redemption of our body, not the glorified body, this body right here on this planet with no pain because you understand revelation. They put John in a boiling pot of hot oil and the man lived. They beat Paul five times and he goes, he broke his, his feet five times with rods and he walked all over the known world. They break every bone in your foot when they do that. Yet he walked all over the known world carrying the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, church, we need the gifts. We need them. Praise God. We're going to get it, though, the former rain and the latter rain in the same season. I'm looking for it. Hallelujah. Glory to God. My Lord. Now, they couldn't kill Paul even though they wanted to. And a group of Jews, they later vowed that they would not eat nor drink until they had killed Paul. And when the chief captain of the Roman guard heard of this plot, he took Paul by night and took him to Caesarea to stand before Felix, the governor. Point number seven, the governor hears Paul's case. They put Paul on the house arrest at Caesarea. Look at Acts 24, 24. And after certain days, when Felix came with his wife, Drusilla, which was a Jewish, he sent for Paul and heard him concerning his faith in Jesus Christ. The governor, Felix, allowed Paul to give his own defense. What favor with God. Amen. And he testified to Felix about his faith in Christ and the hope of the resurrection. This man is on a mission. Nothing deters him. 
no matter what's coming his way. Look at Acts 24, 25. And as he, Paul, reason of righteousness, had the blood of Jesus cleanses from all sin. That's what he was telling Felix. And temperance, how to live a successful, God-fearing life. And judgment to come, that everybody will be judged. And so this governor, this man of authority, the Bible says, Felix trembled and answered, go your way for this time. When I have a more convenient season, I will call for you. Felix never had a more convenient system, a, a season. This was his time. This was his opportunity. He never had an op another opportunity that we find in the scriptures to receive Jesus as his savior. And as far as we know, this man went to hell looking for a more convenient season. And this chapter ends, chapter 24, Paul is still in prison. But he knows his destiny. He's headed to Rome. Point number eight. Paul appears to Caesar. Now another powerful man named Festus. He comes on the scene. And Festus traveled to Caesarea. Because he wanted to hear the complaints. Against this apostle Paul. And he invited him to go to Jerusalem. To be tried. Now look at this. Acts 25 and 7. And when he was come, the Jews which came down from Jerusalem, these are the men that stood against Paul, stood round about and laid many and grievous complaints against Paul, which they could not prove. They just complained and like people talk about you. They can't prove anything. And, and after they tell all their lies on you, they'll have to say, well, I will have to say this. He lives what he says. She lives what she says she lives. Don't think the world's going to love you. Don't think those in the church are going to love you. They got religion. Some of them. Some of them got the goods. And you got the Holy Ghost. And I tell you what. When he goes into a place. He tears things up. Because he's on a mission. He is not a playboy to tickle our fancy. He is on a mission. To apply the blood of Jesus Christ. To people's hearts. And to keep them out of a devil's hell for eternity. That's what he's all about. It's his mission. Verse 8, while he, Paul, answered for himself, here he is, giving his defense again. Neither against the law of the Jews, neither against the temple, nor against Caesar have I offered, offended anything at all. So Paul is answering for himself. Look at verse 9. But Festus, willing to do, look at this, still happens in politics, doesn't it? But Festus, willing to do the Jews a pleasure, answered Paul and said, will that go up to Jerusalem and be judged there? Of these things before me. Now he wanted to take him to Jerusalem. Where these people going to stand against him. Has the world changed at all? He said will you go to Jerusalem. And stand before me. Why didn't he let him stand before him right there. And judge him in Caesarea. No. He wants to do favor. To this political group. When you find a politician like that. Vote him out of office. When you find a group of people like that. Get that counsel out of the system. We, we be Christians, hallelujah. Cast your vote on the right side. Acts 24 and 10. Then said Paul, I stand at Caesar's judgment seat, wherefore I ought to be judged. To the Jews have I done no wrong, as thou very well knowest. That's mighty strong language right there when you're talking to a judge that can determine your destiny. But Paul already knew his destiny. Paul knew he was on his way to Rome. And he knew he was innocent. And so being a Roman citizen. See Paul was an educated man. And he knew his rights. Are you educated enough to understand your rights? Your constitutional rights in this country? You know most people that I talk to. They aren't. They think they just have to take this stuff. That comes down. God help me. Hallelujah. Stay on my subject Lord. So he appeals to Caesar. That's like a man saying, I appeal to the Supreme Court of the land. Look at point number nine. Paul gives his defense before King Agrippa. Now, all these dignitaries are coming, but this is the main man right here in, in, in this land where he is in Caesarea. In this city, Paul kept talking to great people. Then King Agrippa came down to Caesarea to greet Festus. 
And while he was there, Festus asked him to hear about Paul. Now, this is the third time that Paul will relate his story and give his testimony in the night study, that is. And this shows us how powerful our testimony is and why we should share our testimony. I heard Lester Sumrall. I, I, I was very privileged to sit under him and his, some of his preaching and his teaching. And Kenneth Hagin, I've got his books, but I was privileged to be in some of his meetings. And, and every time that they would preach almost, they would give their testimony over and over again. People say, why do you tell that testimony over and over and over? Because we overcome him, the devil, by the blood of the lamb. And by the word of our testimony. And, and Paul, as he stands before King Agrippa, he's allowed to speak for himself again. And Paul begins to tell about his heavenly vision on the Damascus Road, how God healed him and called him to preach the gospel. Man, he, he's not preaching. He's testifying. <laughs> Hallelujah. Your testimony is powerful. Look at Acts 26, 19. He said, whereupon, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient unto the heavenly vision. He was appealing to this king in a different way. He said, I was obedient to the heavenly vision, and I did what God told me to do. He said, I'm God's servant, and I'm obeying God. Now, he was talking to the highest authority in the land, and he was telling him his life story and his ministry. Is this interesting to you? I hope it is. And how he had preached Jesus. And because of that, the Jews wanted to kill him. Acts 26, 21. For these causes, the Jews caught me in the temple and went about to kill me. He's talking to the main man. Having therefore obtained help of God, I continued on this day witnessing both to the small and the great, saying none other things other than those which the prophet Moses did say should come. That Christ should suffer. Now he's preaching to him. And that he should be the first that should rise from the dead and should show the light unto the Gentiles. Hmm. The Gentiles, the people, the nations of the world. And Festus loudly interrupts him. Now, King Agrippa had gone down to visit Festus, but he interrupts him. Look, look at Acts 26, 24. And as he thus spake for himself, Festus said with a loud voice, Paul. Now, besides, I said, much learning has made you mad. <laughs> Tell him you are crazy. You have lost your mind. To put it in old southern slang. Here's a man who was standing before a king now, and he was bringing him divine truth and revelation about how to get saved, giving his testimony. He was telling King Agrippa about his own personal life about his own personal encounter with Jesus. When you give your testimony, I want to tell you that is something powerful. You're not talking about a doctrine when you give your testimony. You're not telling that. You are telling what God has done for you. People will listen to your testimony, people who will not even come to church and listen to the pastor's sermon. That's why your testimony is so powerful. Festus told Paul, you are mad. And Paul graciously answered him. See, when people do you like that, you got to remember whose audience, who the audience is. Watch it, how his gracious answer. Acts 26, 25. But he said, I am not mad, most noble Festus, but speak forth the words of truth and soberness. For the king knoweth these things before whom I also speak freely. For I am persuade, persuaded that none of these things are hidden from him. He's talking to King Agrippa. But this thing was not done in a corner. King Agrippa, believest thou the prophets? I know that you believe them. Now look at verse 28, Acts 26, 28. Then Agrippa said unto Paul, Almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. What a powerful testimony. King Agrippa said, Paul, you have almost persuaded me to give my heart to Jesus and to become a Christian. But this was his time, King Agrippa. This was his moment. 
And King Agrippa, he went to hell, as far as we know, almost persuaded. You know, there are a lot of people in the church like that. You might be looking by Facebook tonight, and you might be like that, almost persuaded. But the king is coming. The only question is, are you ready for him? See, no one ever needs to put off their salvation to some distant time because the Bible says today is the day of salvation, and no one is promised tomorrow. Aren't you glad that God was long-suffering with you? Aren't you glad that God put up with your rejection of his son for all those years, and then he accepted you into the beloved, and now calls you his child? What a gracious God we serve. Now, Paul is in the hands of imperial Rome, and he never gets free again. We'll pick him up next week, but in Acts 27, he was bound in chains, but he was not bound in his spirit. He is headed to Rome because God told him through the gift of the word of wisdom that he would go there, that he would testify there, and that he would preach the gospel there. When he arrived in Rome, he was placed on the house arrest, and he had privilege. That's called divine favor. God had a plan for him. No matter what your adversities, God can give you favor in the midst of the storm. God controls the yeses of Pharaoh and the noes of Pharaoh. There are people that think they're so powerful and they can do so much, but their very breath that they breathe comes forth from the Ra of God, the breath of God. He's a good God that loves us all. Paul preached there in Rome. He preached the kingdom of God, testifying and te teaching people about the saving power of Jesus Christ. Let us stand. Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. Thou art well. Thank you, Lord. This place. It took me all day long to break that down. Holy Spirit. <laughs> I had a good time with the Lord. Come in. Hallelujah. This place. Omnipotent Father of mercy and grace. Thou art welcome in this place. I want everybody to come. There are some people that need a refreshing. Like last night, Lord, I just needed a refreshing. I drove an hour and a half to get there. But I came home bubbling, bubbling, bubbling. You make a sacrifice for God, and I promise you, he'll fill your bubbler up. Woo! Glory. Hallelujah. Holy Spirit, Spirit thou, thou art well. Come put some fire on these altars. If you need fire, come touch it. Glory to God. God, altars are special to God. Hallelujah. Those prophets of old, they built altars. Hallelujah. God met them at the altar. God will meet us at the altar. Hallelujah. Come tell him about your need. Tell him about what you're going through. Tell him about your loved ones. Tell him about your heartaches. Tell him about what you want him to do for you. Say, Lord, I'll do whatever you ask me to do. Some people just need to come and get their joy filled again. Hallelujah. Feel me?